Hi everyone, Nurse Jenny here from Nurse Life Academy, and I'll be reviewing questions and concepts related to hemodynamics that you must know for the CCRN exam. I will time mark this video, so feel free to just scroll through at your own pace, but I do give extra information and explanations after every question to really reinforce the content. Keep in mind that this is just a review, so if there are things that you aren't familiar with, go back, review the information until you feel comfortable and can answer these questions correctly, because these are questions you want to have mastered before going into the exam. I would greatly appreciate if you like and subscribe to my video if you found it helpful, but also so that you can be notified of other videos dropping, which I plan to do about every other week or so. So without further ado, let's talk about shock and hemodynamics, one of my favorite topics. Well, it is now that I understand it, but let me tell you, was I terrified when I was learning it for the first time and taking care of patients with swans. But I promise you that what you need to know for the CCRN is really not as difficult as it seems. And I'm hoping to show you that throughout this video. You can absolutely do this, so let's get started. Question number one. Your patient is admitted for acute on chronic heart failure and a PA catheter is placed. What changes in hemodynamics would you expect to initially observe after a dose of furosemide 40 mg IV push is given? A, decrease in CI or cardiac index, B, decrease in preload, C, decrease in afterload, or D, decrease in SVO2. And the answer is, B, a decrease in preload. So furosemide is a diuretic, which means that the patient is going to diurese, and in doing so, they're going to lose volume, and that will be seen as a decrease in their preload. If you do remember back to the cardiology lecture, can you name any other preload reducers off the top of your head? So there's diuretics, maybe nitroglycerin or morphine. And what patients do you want to avoid preload reducers for? A very specific type of patient. It is patients who have RV infarcts, right ventricular infarcts. I'm just connecting the dots here. If you haven't memorized that chart in my cardiology lecture, it might be a good idea. Wink, wink. Okay, so real quick, let's talk a little bit about the different measurements and hemodynamics that you need to know and what they are. If you feel comfortable with this, feel free to skip forward to the next question. But if not, hang out here with me. So let's start with preload. Preload is a measure of the volume of blood in the ventricle at the end of diastole. It is also known as the stretch of the ventricle at end diastole. It makes sense in my head to think of this as a measure of your volume status. And you do have two ventricles, so there are two measurements of preload. I did group them together here on the left side. So you have the CVP, or the central venous pressure, which is a measurement of the pressure in your right atrium. Sometimes that's called a right atrial pressure or RAP. And this is a measurement of the right side of your heart. A normal CVP is about two to six. The second measure of preload is on the left side of your heart and it's called the PAOP, the pulmonary artery occlusive pressure or wedge pressure. And a normal PAOP is about eight to 12 millimeters of mercury. On the other hand, you have afterload, which is a measurement of the resistance that the ventricle needs to pump against in order to pump blood out of that ventricle. Afterload is measured in systemic vascular resistance or SVR for short. There is also a measurement called the PVR, but that really isn't important for the CCRN, so we'll stick with our SVR. And a normal SVR is 
800 to 1200 dynes per second per centimeter to the negative fifth. Don't worry about the units, just focus on the numbers. To make things easier for us, we can think about afterload or that resistance in terms of vasoconstriction or vasodilation. So if your vessels are vasoconstricted, it's going to require more resistance for that blood to flow through, right? So your SVR is going to be high. On the other hand, when you're vasodilated, the SVR is low because those vessels are open and that blood in the left ventricle won't be needing much resistance being pumped out. Moving on, we'll look at your PA pressure. Similar to a blood pressure, you have systolic and diastolic, and a normal PA pressure is a quarter over a dime, or 25 over 10 millimeters of mercury. I did include SVO2 here, and this tells us about oxygenation at the cellular level, and the normal here is 65 to 75%. I also have cardiac output and cardiac index here. So cardiac output is how many liters of blood your heart pumps out per minute. Normally that's four to six liters a minute. And lastly, the cardiac index, which is your cardiac output, but it is modified to account for your body service area. So it's a little bit more accurate compared to the cardiac output. And you'll generally see the cardiac index used on the CCRN, but that's not to say you shouldn't know the normal range for cardiac output because that might be on there as well. Question number two, which of the following shock states would most likely result in an SVO2 of 83%? A, hypovolemic shock, B, anaphylactic shock, C, septic shock, or D, cardiogenic shock. C, septic shock. So the first question we're going to ask ourselves here is, is an SVO2 of 83% normal? And the answer is no. Normal SVO2 is 65 to 75%. And if it's too high or if it's too low, either way, it's not good for the body. In septic shock specifically, the increase in SVO2 is related to impaired cellular oxygen saturation. What I mean by this is that oxygen delivery, or DO2, is adequate. However, oxygen utilization, or the extraction of the oxygen from the blood, which is VO2, is what's low. A sign of poor oxygen utilization when oxygen delivery is adequate is an elevated SVO2 because oxygen is not being used despite its availability and blood is returning to the pulmonary artery with more oxygen than expected. Let's talk about early or warm septic shock. The hemodynamics of early or warm septic shock include an elevated cardiac output and index, because early on, the sympathetic responses kick in. And this massive inflammatory response and endotoxins are going to increase capillary permeability and cause significant capillary leak, which will decrease your preload. Additionally, this inflammatory response is going to cause massive vasodilation, which is going to decrease the resistance of that blood pumping out, so you'll have a decreased SVR. And then to reiterate the SVO2, increase in SVO2 is related to this impaired cellular oxygen saturation where the oxygen delivery is adequate, but the oxygen extraction from the blood is low. The hemodynamics of early or warm septic shock do differ from the hemodynamics of late septic shock, so just make sure to keep an eye out for that. Most of all, the early or warm septic shock is going to be tested on the CCRN. So for sepsis, we have an evidence-based bundle, which includes labs, fluids, and antibiotics. And you do originally want to draw a lactic acid, which you will treat and trend until it's normalized. You'll want to draw blood cultures and a CBC. 
For fluids, we're going to be giving 30 milliliters per kilogram crystalloid bolus to start. And after that first 30 ml per kg fluid resuscitation, you want to make sure to assess their fluid volume status. And if they're not overloaded, give more fluid. If your MAP is persisting below 65, despite that aggressive fluid administration, you may want to start pressors. Levofed or norepinephrine is going to be your first line presser for septic shock. So here I go with my obsession with charts, and I know it looks scary, but I promise you it's not. This really just helps keep things organized. And I'm not going to go through all these right now, but these are the shock states and the treatments that you need to know. I've included the normal hemodynamic values up top here. And since there is discrepancy based on who you ask or various textbooks or sources, on the CCRN, when they give you hemodynamic values, they are going to be obviously high or obviously low. So if you see here that I have an SVR as 800 to 1200, but you have it memorized as 900 to 1200, do not worry. The questions are not trying to trick you. So just memorize these values or values from a trusted source such as Barron's or past CCRN, and you will be fine. Question number three. A patient with an acute anterior MI has a PA catheter with the following hemodynamic values. Cardiac index of 1.8, PAOP of 18 millimeters of mercury, SVO2 of 48%, and SVR of 1,820. Which of the following would be the most appropriate for this patient? Is it A, start a norepinephrine infusion, B, start a dobutamine infusion, C, start a 1 liter 0.9 bolus over 2 hours, or D, increase the afterload? And the answer is... B, you are going to be starting a dobutamine infusion for this patient. So here we go. What I'm sure everyone has been waiting for, a question that gives you hemodynamic values. When you see this on the exam, you are not going to hyperventilate because we are going to break it down. So it looks like all of the values here are out of range. So we certainly need to do something. And looking at their preload, the PAOP is already 18, which means that they're fluid overloaded since blood is backing up into the pulmonary system. Do not give them fluid because if you do, you're going to drown them. And what you need is more squeeze and a diuretic. We'll go back to the previous question in just a minute here. But first, let me give you a foolproof method to master these hemodynamic questions. If you're cool with this, no worries, just skip ahead. If not, stay here with me and we're going to go through it. So let's start with the cardiac index. Is it normal and do we need to intervene? This is the CCRN, so your patient is probably going to have an abnormal cardiac index, if I were to guess, and we probably will need to intervene. So if our answer is yes, we need to intervene, Let's move on to the preload. If the preload is low, like it is here on the left side example, we have a CVP of 2 and a PAOP of 4. They are hypovolemic. They need volume. And if their preload is high on the right side of the example, you will see a CVP of 14 and a PAOP of 19. They are going to need some squeeze. So let's go back to the previous question and let's break it down. Okay, so first things first. This patient is having an acute anterior MI. So right away, my brain goes to that chart in the cardiology lecture, and I associate it with leads V1 through V4 and potential complications of heart failure or cardiogenic shock. Okay, moving on. Which values are abnormal? 
we're looking at what value first? Our cardiac index, right? So it's 1.8, and because our normal is 2.5 or 3.5, that is abnormal. Next, we're looking at our preload. So our PAOP is 18, whoa, big. <laughs> normal is eight to 12, so that is very high. Our SVO2 is low. Normal is 65 to 75%, so we'll keep that in our back pocket. And then our SVR is high as well. It's 1820. This is elevated as the normal is 900 to 1200. So every single one of our values is out of range. What are we going to do here? Like we just discussed, we're looking at the cardiac index. We're looking at the preload. This patient is overloaded and it means that they need squeeze. So just to double check to make sure that all of our other answers are wrong, well, we just talked about how this patient is overloaded, so we're not gonna give them fluids because they're already drowning. We're not gonna drown them more. That eliminates C. Choice A is norepinephrine, a presser. What do pressors do? They vasoconstrict. But looking at our afterload of 1820, we are already super vasoconstricted. We're not going to increase the workload of the heart, so we're probably not going to choose that. And that will also eliminate option D because, again, we're not increasing preload. So that leaves B, which is the answer that we chose in the first place. Question number four. Afterload is increased in all of the following except A, cardiogenic shock, B, heart failure, C, anaphylactic shock, or D, hypovolemic shock? And the answer here is C, anaphylactic shock. And why is that? So in anaphylactic shock, there is massive vasodilation due to the histamine release. So those vessels are dilated, they are open, and the resistance of the blood that's pumping out is going to be low. In cardiogenic shock, heart failure, and hypovolemic shock, the afterload will be high because of compensatory mechanisms. Anaphylactic shock occurs due to an allergic reaction and an extreme histamine release response. So this histamine release results in massive vasodilation, increased capillary permeability, and decreased cardiac output, which all result in hypotension. On the respiratory side, the histamine release triggers bronchospasm and laryngeal edema. This is the one shock state where all of the arrows are pointing in the same direction and they are all pointing down. So as far as our treatment goes, we are going to remove the offensive agent if possible and we're going to monitor the airway. It is always about A, B, C, airway, breathing, circulation. So monitor your airway, remove the offensive agent, and the first medication you're going to give is 0.3 milligrams of epinephrine, which is going to be a 1 in 1,000 strength in the thigh. Second line medications are going to be diphenhydramine, 25 to 50 milligrams, either IV, IM, or PO, generally preferable to give IV. Steroids are going to be included in second line treatment as well as an inhaled B2 agonist. You can give inhaled racemic epinephrine or the B2 agonist such as albuterol to help decrease that bronchospasm and open up the airways. And lastly, since these patients will have a decreased preload from the capillary leak, volume resuscitation is going to be very important for these patients. Question number five. A patient presented to the ED with a history of aching and fever for two days. The patient was hypotensive to 80 over 60 and not responsive to a bolus of 30 milligram per kilogram 0.9 normal saline. A PA catheter was inserted. 
Your hemodynamic values include a PAOP of 41 over 18, CVP of 14, PAOP of 16, cardiac output of 2.0, and an SVR of 1800. Which of the following treatments would the nurse anticipate? A. Emergent pericardiocentesis. B. Norepinephrine. C. Antibiotics. Or D. Aggressive fluid resuscitation. And the answer here is... A, emergent pericardiocentesis. Now this question is more challenging in that the usual signs of cardiac tamponade, which are your bulging neck veins, muffled heart sounds, a widening mediastinum, and pulsus paradoxus are not provided. However, this patient is presenting with cardiac tamponade as evidenced by the equilibration of CVP, PAD, and PAOP within 5 millimeters of mercury of one another, as well as the narrowing pulse pressure. Question number six. A patient with an inferior wall MI develops sign of right ventricular infarction with right ventricular failure. Which hemodynamic parameters would be most consistent with RV failure? A, a PAP of 53 over 22, PAOP of 16, and CVP of 12. B, a PAP of 32 over 20, PAOP of 14, and CVP of 8. C, a PAP of 48 over 28, PAOP of 14, and CVP of 8. Or D, a PAP of 26 over 12, PAOP of 10, and CVP of 16. And the correct answer is D a PAP of 26 over 12, PAOP of 10, and CVP of 16. So if only the right ventricle is failing, where is it going to back up to? The right atrium. So that the right atrium pressure, or the CVP, is going to be grossly elevated. And it is in A and D. But the wedge is going to be normal since we're not dealing with any left-sided problems in this scenario. So we can eliminate A, and our answer here is D. Question number seven. You are caring for a patient in cardiogenic shock after an anterior wall MI. You note the following hemodynamic parameters. Heart rate of 122, blood pressure of 86 over 44 with a MAP of 58, respiration of 22, O2 SAT of 94%, a cardiac index of 1.8, CVP of 14, PA pressure of 56 over 24, PAOP of 18, SVO2 of 46%, and an SVR of 1675. Which of the following would be the most appropriate therapy at this point? D, norepinephrine, dobutamine, and Lasix. So let's go through it. This certainly looks like a patient in cardiogenic shock. They are hypotensive with a low MAP. They're tachycardic. First things first, we're looking at our cardiac index. It is 1.8. Do we need to do something? Yes, we do, since it's lower than 2.5. Next, we are looking at our preload numbers. So our CVP is 14, which is high, and our PAOP is 18, which is also high. Does this patient need fluid? No, absolutely not. Their preload says that they are overloaded. So let's eliminate our answer choices that have fluid in them. That's going to be A, and that's going to be C. The only difference between the two is that B has vasopressin as its presser, 
and D has norepinephrine as its presser. Which one of these are you going to choose? Norepinephrine is going to be our first line medication. So D is our final answer here. Question number eight. Which medications are most often prescribed for anaphylaxis after initial therapy with IM epinephrine? A, antihistamines and corticosteroids. B, vasopressors and inotropes. C, antihistamines and antibiotics. Or D, corticosteroids and vasopressors. And the answer here is A. An antihistamine will help halt the allergic response, and a corticosteroid is going to help halt the inflammatory response. Vasopressors, inotropes, and antibiotics are not going to be helpful for anaphylactic shock. Question number nine. A 56-year-old patient is admitted after an MVC. A PA catheter is inserted and reveals the following. Cardiac index of 1.9. CVP of 3, PAOP of 6, and SVO2 of 52%. His treatment would include which of the following? A, IV fluids, B, dopamine, C, phenylephrine, or D, dobutamine? And the answer here is A, IV fluids. So again, cardiac index first. It is low, 1.9. We need to do something. Looking at the preload, CVP of 3, PAOP of 6. Those are on the lower side. So we need IV fluids. Low index, low preload. They need fluid. Question number 10. Which of the following sets of hemodynamic data is associated with cardiogenic shock? A, a BP of 78 over 42, heart rate of 120, CVP of 2, PAOP of 4, SVR of 453, and cardiac index of 5.5. B, a blood pressure of 78 over 42, heart rate of 120, CVP of 5, PAOP of 19, SVR of 1697, and cardiac index of 2. C, blood pressure of 78 over 42, heart rate of 120, CVP of 15, PAOP of 5, SVR of 1300, and CI of 2.5, or D, blood pressure of 78 over 42, heart rate of 120, CVP of 1, PAOP of 4, SVR of 1387 and cardiac index of 3. The answer here is B. In cardiogenic shock, remember, we have blood backing up into the left ventricle and thus into the lungs. This leads to a high PAOP and wet lungs. This should be a giveaway to the answer since B is the only one with a high PAOP. They will also have a low cardiac index and a high SVR because it's compensating for that low blood pressure. So B is going to be our answer here. Question number 11. A patient presents to the ER one week status post right hip arthroplasty. She has a MAP of 58 after 2 liters of 0.9 normal saline, a heart rate of 121, respiratory rate of 34, temperature of 39.3 degrees Celsius. Her lungs are clear, skin is warm and dry, white blood cell count is 20,000, and blood cultures are positive for gram-negative organisms. The patient does not have a pulmonary artery catheter, but if she did, what SVR should the nurse anticipate that this patient would have? A, 2,550, B, 1,550, 
C, 550, or D, 900? And the answer here is C, 550. So for this question, we have to put the picture together. This patient, with all of her symptoms, is presenting with septic shock following her hip arthroplasty. If we remember our shock table, a patient in septic shock is going to have a decreased afterload due to the massive inflammatory response, which is going to cause vasodilation, and that's going to decrease the resistance of the blood pumping out, so you will have a decreased SVR. Question number 12. Which is a compensatory mechanism of hemorrhagic shock? Is it A, peripheral vasodilation, B, parasympathetic stimulation, C, increased reabsorption of sodium and water, or D, increased fluid shift from the capillaries to the interstitial space? And the answer here is going to be C, increased reabsorption of sodium and water. So in hemorrhagic or hypovolemic shock, compensatory mechanisms within the renal tubule cause the release of aldosterone. This results in an increase in reabsorption or retention of sodium and water and expansion of the circulatory volume to maintain blood pressure. So if what I just said in the last slide was a bunch of mumbo jumbo, let's look at this diagram and see if it will help. So in hemorrhagic or hypovolemic shock, you are losing fluid and volume, and your body senses this fluid and volume loss. In order to compensate and maintain your blood pressure, it activates RAS, or the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And this activation of RAS results in two things. On the left side here, we have an increase in renin secretion, and on the right side, you have aldosterone release. So pertaining to this particular question, the aldosterone release results in increase in sodium and water retention, which is going to maintain your blood pressure in a time of losing fluid and volume. Question number 13. The difference between a dopamine drip at 5 to 10 mics per kilogram per minute and a dopamine drip greater than 10 mics per kilogram per minute is A. Dopamine at 5 to 10 mics per kilo per minute stimulates the beta-1 receptors in the heart to increase contractility. B. Dopamine at 5 to 10 milligrams per kg per minute stimulates the alpha receptors in the arteries to cause vasoconstriction and increase afterload. C. Dopamine greater than 10 mics per kg per minute stimulates the beta-1 receptors in the heart to increase contractility. Or D. Dopamine greater than 10 mics per kilogram per minute stimulates the beta-1 receptors in the arteries to cause vasoconstriction and increase afterload. And the correct answer here is... A. Dopamine at 5 to 10 mics per kilo per minute stimulates the beta-1 receptors in the heart to increase contractility. Now I know that there are a lot of words on this page and it is a little tricky to digest, but in short, mid-range dopamine, so that's going to be your dopamine at 5 to 10 mics per kg, stimulates the beta-1 receptors in the heart to increase contractility. And on the other hand, high-dose dopamine, so greater than 10 mics per kg, stimulates the alpha receptors in the arteries to cause vasoconstriction and to increase afterload. I've included yet another chart 
and this has some pressors as well as dobutamine, but I really wanted to show the effects on alpha and beta receptors here. So remember, alpha receptors are located primarily in the blood vessels, and beta receptors are located in both the heart as well as bronchial and vascular smooth muscle. Beta-1 receptors are located in the heart, and an easy way to remember this is one heart, two lungs. So one heart means beta-1, and two lungs means beta-2, or the bronchial and vascular smooth muscle. Question number 14. A patient presents with near syncope. His vital signs and assessment include a blood pressure of 99 over 60, heart rate of 108, clear lungs, skin is cool and dry, neck veins are flat, and dry oral mucous membranes. A recheck of the blood pressure is 88 over 60, which is indicated for this patient. A. Volume expansion is needed to increase preload and increase myocardial stretch. B. Pressors are needed in order to increase afterload and increase myocardial stretch. C. Volume expansion is needed to decrease afterload and increase myocardial stretch. Or is it D. Pressors are needed to decrease preload and decrease myocardial stretch. And the answer here is A, volume expansion is needed to increase preload and increase myocardial stretch. So this patient scenario is one of hypovolemia. Fluid administration is going to increase the preload or it's going to fill up the tank, which will in turn improve the myocardial stretch. Since this patient is volume depleted, the systemic vascular resistance, or the SVR, is going to be high because vasoconstriction occurs as a compensatory response to maintain the arterial blood pressure. I know I've said this a million times, but pressors should not be used in the presence of hypovolemia. Your afterload is already going to be high, and what you need is fluid. This question does not give us hemodynamic values, but what it does give us is a good assessment that kind of in its own way gives us hemodynamic values. So it's telling us he has clear lungs, flat neck veins, and dry oral mucous membranes. That is not a sign of someone who is fluid overloaded. So sometimes you really just have to put all of these assessment findings together and think about it in the terms of your patient presentation. Last but not least, we are on question 15. A patient is admitted complaining of crushing chest pain, which began two hours ago. An EKG shows ST elevation in leads V2 through V4, which is treated with a PCI procedure to the LAD. Following the procedure, the patient develops oliguria and bilateral diffuse crackles, which hemodynamic findings should be expected at this point. A. Blood pressure of 80 over 50, cardiac output of 3.8, SVR of 2200, and a PA pressure of 40 over 24. B, a blood pressure of 86 over 50, cardiac output of 5.0, SVR of 1000, and a PA pressure of 30 over 10. C, a blood pressure of 85 over 56, cardiac output of 2.9, SVR of 660, and a PA pressure of 20 over 14, or D, a blood pressure of 90 over 60, cardiac output of 6.8, SVR of 500, and a PA pressure of 18 over 4. And the answer here is 
A, blood pressure of 80 over 50, cardiac output of 3.8, SVR of 2200, and a PA pressure of 40 over 24. So this patient had an anterior infarction, and that predisposes them to the development of what? That's right, left ventricular failure or cardiogenic shock. They're going to have a low cardiac output or index and a high SVR. So the hemodynamic data in A is going to be most consistent with left ventricular failure or cardiogenic shock. The other values are not consistent with that. All right, we have made it to the end. If you got questions wrong, don't worry. Go back, review the content, come back until you get the question right, and then you understand why. Again, this is all information that you want to have mastered going into the CCRN, and I know that hemodynamics and shock is scary, but you can absolutely do this. So good luck. You have got this. If you liked the video or found it helpful, please like and subscribe and let me know if you have any questions. I'd be more than happy to help. Thank you everyone for watching. Nurse Jenny signing off here for Nurse Life Academy. Have a good one.